Uh, in 2013, you were on stage in San Francisco, right? Yeah, basically, it was uh, as any good founder when you hear from like San Francisco, and you're uh, <laughs> like, thanks very much, Enjoy the Ireland. Uh, <laughs> it was actually Dave Scanlon at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Team. Dave Scanlon was working with Edge with Ireland at the time, and mm -hmm. I think they had a slot. They've obviously sponsored it, so they had a slot for some Irish uh, entrepreneur to speak. And obviously, everyone else is busy, and then mm -hmm. I was available, and uh, so it was great. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, flash forward to 2018, you no longer live in Ireland. Yeah. So, uh, you used to be, um, in my eyes anyway, one of the kind of poster boys for poster men uh, for uh, for entrepreneurship in Ireland, and you spoke a lot about the Dublin ecosystem and how powerful it was. So what's changed since? Well, I'm now officially a poster boy. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't believe this, but I have a male modeling career in Berlin. That's what brought me there. It's obviously pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is. Yeah, it's, it's, to explain that joke. Um, uh, Zalando, which is a big e-commerce company, mm -hmm. I think we're targeting fat, pasty Irish dads as a demographic. <laughs> and, uh, I knew the VP of engineering in there, and uh, they asked me to do some campaign. It was during the Rugby Six Nations last year, so I went out between the game and halftime, took three photos, went home, and that was it. And then I landed back in Berlin, and there was literally posters up all over Berlin, 6,000 posters, and people were like, what the fuck is <laughs> happening? Wow. So I literally am a poster boy of Berlin, too. So it's, okay. It's, uh, and what was their impact on sales? Year. I think I got a free T-shirt. Uh, yeah, there's, like the stock price is up about two billion since. So, I mm. yeah. okay. Uh, but to answer your question in a serious way, um, <laughs> yeah, I know at the time again, um, you know, as a startup, you try and grab any piece of press or any type of uh, uh, you can. And we'd raise some money, we'd built, uh, we'd built a team, and we we had an exciting story. And I think I started at Web Summit, um, and Web Summit was it was BWS. One, two, three, and four. I don't know if people remember it was Dublin before it was mm -hmm. Web Summit, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that was about two, three hundred people, maybe getting to five hundred people. And we actually launched first at that, and uh, like no one had ever heard of Data Hub. We've been here for a year, Dublin Kerry, kind of programming and building it, and then launched literally on the twenty eighth of September. I remember it, and there was a startup competition, mm -hmm. and we won. Winning that was great, but then the next three, four weeks, we won every startup competition. We won like Inter, Inter Trade Ireland's seed corn competition, our software association, we had a really good innovative technology and uh, no one had heard of us and we kind of came from nowhere. So there was a, we kind of hit the ground running with some PR and press around mm -hmm. that and we milked the living crap out of it for about two years after that. Okay. Um, but that's not a correlation with success, it's just an ability to uh, um, grab a microphone and not give it back, basically. Okay, yeah. cool. So we'll talk a little bit later on about the differences between Berlin and Dublin and uh, Europe and Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to go back to kind of the, the starting point for, for Datahug and what your um, original vision was. And you said something to me uh, that really stuck. So you said you were trying to automate the Irish pub. Can you explain that a little bit? Uh, yeah. Um, so... Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so you say these funny lines and you have to explain them afterwards. And at the time, it's great crack. It's like kind of explaining our joke in a pub the next day. Um, so yeah, I worked in management consulting. So I, my, my background is computer science, um, uh, which means I'm lazy. And I got into computer science and I want to automate stuff. And the computer should do all the work for us. I think that's the dream we've all been told. And that's why I'm still in it, um, as my wife will testify in the laziness. Um, but, so I did computer science, and I had my first start in college, and then I went, I'll skip that, and I went management consulting for six years. And coming from Ireland, you presume everybody knows everyone, yeah. which we call, and then you land in London, and you land in New York, you land mm -hmm. in Boston, you're like, oh, you're from Texas, do you know John? And um, sometimes they do, and it's quite funny, but more often than not, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, so you get, I was used to that, and that was how I b built every conversation, like, like, where are you from, and what's good you went to, because I was trying to find common connections. Because if you found those common connections in business, it was hugely impactful. But as working with this organization, PA Consulting Group, second oldest consultant firm in the world, all Oxford, Cambridge types, 3,000 people all over the world, it was, it was great. I spent six years there. Uh, but increasingly, I had to move into more of a sales role. And it was all about who knows who. Mm -hmm. And it was all about who, who, who I could interact with. And for five years, I keep getting frustrated by this. And that eventual frustration boiled over into what became Data Hub. Mm. Yeah. So six years is quite a long time to spend at a very traditional business, um, considering mm -hmm. you know what you're doing now. So <coughs> how did you survive that? It was, I was in tears leaving that organization. <laughs> I okay. loved it. I, I grew up there. It was kind of like my web summit experience. You know, it's uh, <laughs> the, the place you work really hard, build great connections, great network. Like it was a really unique 
strategy and management consultancy firm. It was like set up in World War Two. They were designing like uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes, and they're mm -hmm. still just the guys would drive into work or with their home built cars. It was full of these crazy professor types. I always describe it as. What kept it interesting to me? I thought it was two years. But, um, it was like every three months I had a new project somewhere else in a different mm -hmm. area in a different world. So I could be doing computational chemistry with Pfizer. I could be doing building a bank in Denmark. I most randomly worked in uh, Jamaica with the fire brigade. Uh, I think I was probably the first Irish guy and last Irish guy to work with the Jamaican fire brigade. <laughs> um, don't save up the first floor in Jamaica is my little tip. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I went back to Jamaica, worked in the Ministry of Education and e-learning projects. I worked in Dubai. So it was, it, was, it was kind of like being in a safe startup environment where I was a product guy, I was building products, mm -hmm. or I was doing strategy on products, and I was coding 50% of the time, which I loved. And uh, so uh, I got to live in the States for three years with them as well which was like, you know, after getting promoted a few times was, was great. Nobody was looking over your shoulder, you could do what you wanted. So it was ultimate freedom, it was, it was great projects, great work, and uh, I have a big love for PA, and I have a big love for, for consulting since, so I was never bored there. But I was frustrated because my career was moving from doing the operational stuff to now delivering projects to selling projects. And as that was where my frustration increased, so it was actually the frustration there was 3,000 amazing colleagues, like. I'm off in Jamaica, there's another team off in Uganda doing something for the Bill and Melinda Gates. And we have all these people doing amazing stuff, meeting amazing people, mm -hmm. but we couldn't figure out who knew who. Mm -hmm. And we'd CRM systems about it. And I was like, this, this really irked me and irked me and irked me. OK, so I'm sure there's uh, a lot of people in the room who, who work for larger companies and who maybe are thinking about going out and, and starting on their own. So at what point did you decide, OK, you know, I'm doing this, it's going to happen? Yeah, so I don't think I'm a natural entrepreneur. I'd say I'm more of a founder, and I kind of differentiate between what I think an entrepreneur is and a founder is. And uh, funny enough, the word entrepreneur is supposedly founded by, it, it came up by a carry man. So I don't know if you know this. So entrepreneur was a carry economist in the 1870s, living in Paris. And uh, I loved his definition of what an entrepreneur was. It's in Wikipedia, so it's true. Um, <laughs> his definition of an entrepreneur. Did you put it there? <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. My, yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, I'm from Cork, so I definitely didn't put it there. Um, <laughs> It said an entrepreneur basically in some French economist magazine was defined as somebody who buys something at a fixed price and sells it at an unknown price. And I think that's just a really simple, pure definition of an entrepreneur. You're kind of you're trading, you're buying it at one euro, trying to sell it for two euro. And like you think of you're investing all this time and capital and, and everything and you don't know what your return is going to be often for months, years later. So mm -hmm. I suppose in that sense, comfortable with the risk of an entrepreneur, but I think uh, and a founder is a slightly different thing. And I totally forget what your question was. But, uh, when did you decide to I'm give up I'm getting your free drinks and carry kind of them. Your very stable day job and decide oh, yeah. to wait. Uh, yeah, so own, I just got, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. Um, so I went all the way to America. And uh, like every Irish guy, like, going back to the pub scene, like the dream is probably open a pub in New York or something like that. Or my dream was uh, actually to get a green card and become a landscaper in Nantucket, actually, was my, was my dream. Uh, a few people in the room know about that. Um, but. The, it was my wife, basically, my, my now wife. So like, you, you can give all these backstories, real deep insight, blah, blah, blah. But she was a diplomat. I was living in New York. I met her. She was an Irish diplomat. So I go all the way to America, and I meet a girl from Bray. Uh, so living the dream. And um, we uh, were going out, and then her posting was up, and she was moving home. And that was the catalyst. I was always thinking of data hug or the idea of data hug mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, so I think what often happens in the corporate world, just some other external catalyst, maybe there's downsizing, the economy is changing, whatever else. You see a lot of entrepreneurship in the back of that. So I was very happy and just too busy in the day job to actually have time to think about it, to quit. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually, like, I had to take this year sabbatical and I was like, okay, Aoife's gone home. Um, I'll take a year sabbatical and I'll travel the world for a year and I'll do some coding down in Buenos Aires and I'll maybe go to Silicon Valley and I'll have all this fun. And uh, so I took the sabbatical, had my green card, could come back, was happy out. And um, I, I don't know would I have ever quit or would I have ever come mm -hmm. home. Um, but an uh, Irish woman dragged me back. And, uh, <laughs> and I moved, I was literally driving between Cork and Dublin and I heard Jerry Kennelly, this really interesting slash uh, interesting um, Irish entrepreneur who sold a company for 160 million down in Kerry. Uh, he sold a company called Stockbite. It was like Getty Images. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Uh, amazing uh, vision for Kerry and he was on the phone I, I, he was on the radio and I was driving Cork to Dublin and he was like we're gonna build Silicon Valley down here in Kerry and I come laugh my ass <laughs> off and I'm like blah 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 and we're this is 2009 and uh, September 2009 October 2009 and he's like we're gonna bring in the best mentors from Ireland they were part of the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Network and he started listing off Terry Clune, uh, Cullum Lyon, uh, Ray Nolan I was like whoa 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 these are amazing amazing entrepreneurs 
and uh, amazing mentors, and that was something I'd recognize in my career mentorship, and I talk about that with Techstars later, mentorship is so important, that I said, feck it, I might as well apply. <clears throat> and long story short, it was like he called my bluff. Basically, I, I made up an application. I, I'd worked in consulting for six years, so I knew how to write these <laughs> really good proposals, and Gartner says this, and blah, blah, blah. I think I wrote it in about an hour, and I just submitted it, and mm -hmm. some of it may be factually true or not, I'm not sure. But um, I, uh, he, they called me and interviewed me, and I got it. And then, so then like a month later, they come up, so instead of being down in Buenos Aires, you know, learning tango and whatever else, coding by day. I think that's what Stripe did, so I could have been Stripe. Um, <laughs> that I ended up down in Phoenix, County Kerry, basically, and I almost came back in the exact same plane, I think the IMF guys from DC, there was a direct flight from DC, it was like the Irish economy was crumbling, and came back in, uh, went down to Phoenix and started Data Hug. Yeah. Okay, cool. And at that stage, did you have your co-founder Ray on board, or were you? No, no, it was, it was again, on my own, it was, uh, so this is September, October 2009, <laughs> And uh, we, I, the accelerator, I don't know, it was an incubator, I don't even know what the, it was, they called Endeavor, it was a great program, and great entrepreneurs on that. And uh, it was a culture shock, I've been living in London for three years, States for three years, and suddenly I'm in Phoenix. I don't know if you're Phoenix, like, the Phoenix Lighthouse weather report is blah, blah, blah. It's like the west of the west of Ireland, it's like the sheep, the mountains, the Atlantic, it's the wild Atlantic way out. And uh, it was beautiful, I loved it. And, uh, worked my ass off for the next six months literally down there in incubation mode it was like you know uh these uh, german go off to the west of ireland and write some poetry i was down there writing javascript and and sql my sql and all that kind of stuff and built the product for about six months with the mentorship i was probably the least advanced company on that program there's companies that are doing a million revenue and there's some great companies there and um had great mentors, but I was kind of, yeah, so I did that for about like eight months probably before I met Ray and then uh, brought Ray on board. And it sounds so beautiful, idyllic. Yeah, um, Celtic mysticism, kind of me tunes, <laughs> kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So within those initial eight months, did anyone ever tell you, you're crazy, this will never work, uh, don't like the idea, you should, shouldn't do it? Um, one person might have said this is a feature, not a product, and mm. I remember that, but that's the only thing. Maybe people said it to me, but that's the only thing I remembered because mm -hmm. it, it kind of pissed me off. But um, I don't remember the rest of it. I think it was so early and it was so, like, that's the magical stage where everything's possible and yeah. swipe boards and blah, blah, blah. And I had a good answer for most things, in fairness. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we talked about the importance of optimism versus realism as well in the early days. Um, so you talk a lot about the importance of people building a team, um, <coughs> having a team buy into your vision. So talk to us a little bit about how you built the team at Datahook from you know one to thirty, and how you went about that process. Yeah, uh, well, I think Ray was probably the the first. The, Ray came aboard as my co-founder in probably April May twenty ten. Um, and I was like, I had no, well, I had money to live, basically. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of convince them your vision. And Ray had just been back from Australia. I'd done a similar path with Accenture, was a manager there. Brilliant engineer, like the MIT Media Labs, mm -hmm. was doing a PhD in neural net and brain analysis stuff. Just absolutely brilliant. Um, but we didn't know each other that well, but like literally in the space of about like, tw I was so kind of tired and burnt out from all of that. But he really connected with the vision, having come from consulting, having seen the same problem, same point in his career. That he came on board uh, as co-founder, again, no salaries, so you have to convince other smart people to join you to, you know, a, a vision, they say, a difference between hallucination, hallucination and a vision, you know, you're kind of, you have that yourself, whereas a vision is two people having a hallucination or more. So, um, so Ray joined whatever drugs I was taking on to carry and came on board, and in fairness, we worked our asses off, and he quit then Accenture, and uh, we worked together for then, we, that was for May, and then we launched in October 28. And I remember why it was October, because nobody externally had heard, there was no press, because we were worried about patents and stuff like that. So we filed patents, we figured out how to file patents. We filed patents like on the 27th of October, because we were gonna pitch at Web Summit on the 28th, and we knew like Zenstrom from Stripe, you know, Dorsey, it was the first time the big yeah. stars were coming in, and uh, it was, we'd never really pitch it in public or anything. And then that was the start of this press momentum and investor momentum. Like after we won the web summit the next day, it was like the investors were ringing up like nonstop for about a week. We were like, yeah, we were the guys who invested in Facebook. I was like, who are you, Excel Ventures? Like, whoa, and they're like, we fly you to London, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, just started getting nuts. Wow. But despite all that momentum and press, and we had a product that was working and it still took six months to raise a round. And on the back of that, then we, we started hiring people probably in, uh, actually I remember it was probably April 2011 when mm -hmm. we started. So it was, it was 
bootstrapping for about a year and a half mm -hmm. at least, yeah, mm -hmm. and then started using that money. We raised a million and a half, uh, a million and a half dollars, two of us, and then we raised probably another four million, probably a year and a half later, and we eventually grew the team to like 30 plus, I think, at that point, and then, yeah. Okay, and how, so you've, you've just mentioned a really important point there, so the two of you basically existed on no salary. Yeah, I'm sorry, you say growing the uh, team then, like yeah. it was, again, it was through network, there was a guy, uh, Zed, uh, Jonathan, Zed Massoud, who I'd worked with in Copenhagen, Jonathan Cedar, who had worked with in the UK, uh, Ray tapped into his network, got more people he'd worked with in Accenture who were great, uh, Kevin Mannion, DJ Cal, uh, I can't remember the order, everyone came on board. Twitter was really effective, actually, we got in Sheila Kinsla, came on board. We hired interns out of Canada, out of this university called Waterloo, which I think is an amazing university. Remember Ray went off to his wedding, we just fresh intern and said, you're now the CTO, she almost started crying. Uh, <laughs> but she was, because we had a client presentation the next day, but she was brilliant, we threw her right in the deep end. Um, we were in a shed in the back of Bagot Street somewhere. Um, but we were, again, we were scraping all the way. I remember like, just before we got the funding, I remember Tesco, well, Paul is here, a, a friend, but another friend who was working with uh, Google at the time, and I, here's a pro tip if you're fundraising, uh, or you're bootstrapping, try and meet Googlers around lunchtime because you get a free lunch maybe if you meet them. Yeah. So once a week I'd go meet Val from Profiteero, who's a hugely successful uh, startup. Um, I'd also, the Tesco had a meal deal, there was a Tesco in their office, like two euro fifty. I remember that was my budget, two euro fifty every day for about six months when we, were, when we moved to Dublin after Kerry. And then I remember the week we got our funding because the meal deal went up to three euros and I was <laughs> like, oh man, I think I had like 120 euros in my bank account at that point. Like, uh, so we were pretty burning on fumes at that point, but again, we spent eight, six, eight months, six months, eight months fundraising on the back of that, and it just that was just a lot of inefficiency, a lot of stupid mistakes, and blah blah blah. But like in, in the end, we had five or six different investors at the end, kind of coming out of so, kind of they all came out of the woodwork at the end and stuff like that. But then building the team, I can't remember the exact order, but we like Owen Barrow was in there early. Um, yeah, we 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 had some good characters uh, growing, and we kept growing the team, and we no one ever left the company actually. I remember actually we interviewed you, Ashling, at one point. Uh, actually, did you in, get the job? in no, I think you did get the job. I don't think you responded, or you, you we wanted to do another interview, but you had, I think, uh, uh, cleverly identified I there was I did not get the job. better opportunities. <laughs> uh, I need to check those emails. Um, yeah, but people like Bobby, Chris Murphy, we interviewed as well, who was with uh, Web Summit. Um, so it was great, and Web Summit was growing at the same time as well. Um, so I can't remember the exact details, but the team were really, really amazing, like Sheila had a PhD in social network analysis that worked with Yahoo, you know, uh, DJ, I think 600 points is leaving cert kind of thing, and Ray was probably the same. So we had this really strong team who did, who worked amazing hard, are still very much involved in Data Hug, and like, it's amazing. I think we had known in the first 30 people who left the company. Um, so we, I don't know what we did in culture, or not, not doing in culture, but um, I think it was just a really tough, problem we were targeting and we were very international and we were very ambitious. We messed up loads of things, but um, mm -hmm. we, had, um, we had a pretty good, good group. Yeah. So you said there you hired, <coughs> between the two of you, you hired 30 people, no one left. How did you find 30 amazing people who fit your values, who maybe weren't motivated by money because you probably couldn't match uh, competitors' salaries? How did you, you know, what was your interview process like and what was your screening and, and how did you make sure that you got and built this amazing team? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> just, uh, people, the first, f first five to ten people are through your network. Mm -hmm. So that's your networking. So through my network and through Ray's network, we'd work with great people who we trusted and they trusted us and they, 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 they gave us. And then in the back of that, you, your first six, seven people are probably core, I think. Um, I'd hired from a university in Canada, we, we built out in the US, and that was more difficult because they weren't in the office with us, so I think we had a few, uh, like we hired some great people, but we just never fully connected, and it was also sales, I think we were, we were more comfortable hiring on engineering and, and product, because we were both, that was probably one of the challenges, myself and Ray were both uh, very technical, mm -hmm. um, so we probably were missing that marketing, kind of sales, commercial, natural co-founder, um, who would have, been able to build that network out for us, and we were always behind. We were, that was one of the big mistakes. We hired very slow or incorrectly, maybe on sales and hiring. I think that's a common mistake for a lot of uh, startups. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how did you work out your commercial model and pricing then, if you didn't have anyone on board that was kind of a natural salesperson? Well, we didn't really. And like that was that was the biggest challenge for Data Hook. I think like we the market wasn't like the challenge we had with the market was 
up until about 2014 um, was that we we were trying to go, we had to educate the market. Nobody knew, nobody was like, oh, wake up in the morning, I need to find relationship intelligence technology. I need to solve who knows who. Um, so it was very evangelistic selling, which meant knocking on doors, talking to people, which meant it was 100 times harder. Um, so one of the things I'd learned, like, is, is the market there? Um, like, can you tap into demand response? Can, is there people searching Google uh, or, or other networks? Uh, or, you know, can you, or do you have to do demand generation? Do you have to create uh, demand and educate the market? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we played with loads of different models, but ultimately, it's per mailbox. We were probably, because we were mining emails and phone calls and calendars, so it's per mailbox per user kind of thing, was kind of one of the proxies we had. But we didn't have a really clear, scalable model, I think. Um, and until about 2014, where we realized this is a platform we'd built, and we needed to focus on use cases. Instead of the market coming to us and saying, oh, you've got this great, amazing platform, here are the APIs, we'll build something, don't worry about it. Um, we had to, like, the market wants something that they can just use straight away for a problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones we saw an awful lot was around sales uh, forecasting. And sales forecasting is where, you know, the simple analogy would be uh, you ring a girl 10 times and she doesn't get back to you. That date isn't happening on Saturday night. The exact same thing in sales. If we see you're emailing, um, you're emailing Bank of Ireland 10, 15, 20 times and you're not getting back to you, to get back to you every once or every 10 emails. Mm -hmm we could very accurately forecast sales um, closing. And we actually got to a 90, 95% sales accuracy and forecasting. So if you look at datahug.com now, it's a sales forecasting platform. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was more like we had this broad vision and we had to really, really, really narrow it. And uh, it was around that point I left about 2014 uh, where like, there was we had different ideas because we all wanted to go in different directions. And that ultimately we kind of that was the right decision then to focus on, on, on the forecasting, the build out and reposition it. And it's easier to sell when you go, people are looking for sales forecasting, you know it's a sales operations team, you know it's someone who's running Salesforce. Salesforce is an investor at this stage, um, so it was a lot easier to sell it, but it was, uh, it was more niche. And I think starting with a niche and then growing out is probably a better way than starting really broad and then going narrow into a niche. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I mean, you're dead right, it's really difficult to educate a market on a new product, try and set the pricing for something when you know there's there's no budget in the in the company for it. Um, so talk us through that period because I can imagine that was a little bit tricky for you. Yeah. Um, you know, and and kind of maybe you had to let go of whether you had any ego around your original vision and, and what you saw Data Hub to be, and then what it, it turned out to be. Yeah, ego is the enemy. Is that's a pretty good book if you haven't read it. Um, and you see it in your consulting career, you walk into a room and there's like 100 people there and they've all been working together for two years on this problem and they're all like, man, we're freezing cold. And you come in as a consultant, you're like, the window's open, why don't you just close the window? And they're like, well, you're a genius, come back again for another consulting gig. And you're like, okay. <laughs> but when you're then on the others, I was a consultant, I was like, why are they paying us so much money? Like, it's so obvious what they should do here in many scenarios. And then I think uh, being in that scenario where you're, you're so intent, you're trying so many things and you, you've You've got so many leads going, and you've got a lead for this product and lead for this product. It's uh, and you sort of you're kind of thinking about. I think, yeah, the thing I learned was you don't have to give up on your vision. It's more of a prioritizing what you're going to sell this quarter, next quarter, and so forth. So it's it's not that you're not going to ever do that. It's just you're not going to do that this quarter, next quarter. So it's discipline. I think is one thing I, I would say uh, I lacked definitely. Like kind of wanting to do a lot of this. And I was very much focused on when we were the B2C. Like the Web Summit was a customer with a lot of VCs as customers, probably like 40 VCs as customers. And like Datahog unlocked all of the networks by, so you think a bigger company would do better. We were targeting bigger companies and we started focusing on enterprise sales. Um, and I think I wanted to focus on the smaller companies because they were better usage. They were actually, they're, they're sort of a freemium model and kind of give this thing away for free. I still think there's a massive potential for that. And around that time as well, we had a potential exit and uh, for various reasons, because we, we were so spread, I wanted us to take that exit. And uh, we, there was a big falling out where we, you know, one group didn't want to take it. So the board didn't want to go with that deal and to keep going down another path. And I, I, I didn't fully believe in that path. Um, so that was kind of uh, the big lesson there was, you know, you start the company, you're the founder of the company, but when you raise equity, when you raise investment, if you're not optimizing for control, I was optimizing more for valuation, uh, which is where I thought that's where you optimize for, because we're all in the same view here. But often, 
investors are investing for different reasons and, and other people on the management team see different strategies. So mm -hmm. um, when you kind of disagree over that, that's a fundamental problem. And I think I was then at the point thinking, okay, this is, we should sell this. And I think when you tell the board as the founder that we should sell, they're like, okay, well, he doesn't want to be here anymore. And that wasn't it. It was more this, we tried it, we're ambitious, we've got a good opportunity here. We're kind of very thinly spread, and this seems like a really good exit that could grow into something much bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still think that would have been the right decision. So what it meant, we were sold the company in 2014, rather than kind of in 2016, where we did later. Where we did get a, uh, but I wasn't involved in the actual end sale of the business then. Okay, um, so there was a, a great article <coughs> published a couple of days ago on Forza.ie, an interview with Connor in advance of this talk, and one of your quotes uh, from the article says, something along the lines of, you can have a great idea, a great uh, team, great execution, but you know, still things don't work uh, you know, according to plan. If the market's so, not there, exa exactly. Like, so just, what's the yeah. secret sauce? What's kind of, what's missing? The market. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, as an investor okay. now, on the other side, you probably move, switch on hats more to tech stars, and you kind of see it, you can see like, you can, have just, you can do all, your, like just three real criteria an investor should really look at a company. It's like, the team, uh, so there's, Okay, I'm well, giving away team, market, and product, right? So they're the three areas that an investor will be kind of assessing you on. Mm -hmm. And which one do you think is the highest priority? Which, which is the one they focus on the most? Now, the official answer to Texas is team. Yeah, yeah, because we're investing so early stage. But actually, the majority of investors, and particularly slightly later stage, will look at market because you can give a team $100 million and if the market's bad, they can't fix them. The 100 million isn't going to create a market for your product if it isn't there or how it's positioned. You may have to reposition it. Now, if the market's there and your product is kind of crap and your team's crap, 100 million will fix that massively. So 100 million will fix the team and it'll also fix the product. Uh, you can do all of these engineering on the team and everything, cap tables and all that kind of stuff. But the market's there, they want it. You can grow into a billion dollar business. Whereas if you give it 100 million dollars and the market isn't there or the market isn't there how you originally uh, assumed it was going to be, you're in trouble. And that's kind of um, the, the big area to think about. So, it's, so you can test. So a lot of people, I was talking to someone earlier about our startups, and not just our startups, startups everywhere. And as a computer scientist, like the, the thing I have to resist is building my solution straight away, whereas what you should be doing is building your experiments straight away. Building my experiments to test is the market there. So on Techstars, when companies come in, we, we had a great guy, Peter O'Malley, if anyone's ever met Peter, he is a genius, um, and it's now an it's officially saying he's a genius. But like Paddy, Paddy Cosgrove had an interview. To give you a sense of, Paddy Cosgrove had an interview recently, and Peter was one, head of growth at Web Summit, I think, in early, early days. And he says he, he's talking to the talent they hired, and Peter was a guy who, Paddy said, you know, early days, oh, can you get me McKinsey on the phone there next week? The head guy here, and Peter's like, okay. And pa Paddy walks into the meeting room like a week later, and there's like a big video conference, and it's the CEO of McKinsey globally. It wasn't like McKinsey Dublin, it was like the C and Peter had arranged that and gotten that and everything. So he's, that's the kind of talent I think that came out of Web Summit. And Peter came onto the program, and he's all about experiments and growth, and he was an EIR in the program. And teams that came on were like straight away, okay, all your CTOs, you're all fired. Go into a room with Peter, he's going to show you to run experiments to see if the market's there or how you go to market, how you test, how you test the channels, how you test acquisitions, landing pages, everything like that, emails, outreach, positioning, all of that. And uh, they all became what we joked, CMTOs, Chief Marketing Technology Officers, and, and they became obsessed with growing the pipeline and growing that. And I think if you can do that, you can build a growth story which will bring the team together, cohesion, but you can test early on, is the market there, is it not, do we need to change, rather than building out your engineering and then finding that out. So I kind of made that classical mistake to a certain extent. Okay, so um, let's go back to when, okay, so you, you finished up the data, you were thinking about what you're gonna do next. Um, you, you've said a few times you weren't sure if you wanted to be a founder again, and then you decided to join Techstars and Accelerator. And why, what made you make that decision? Well. Yeah, there was, a, there, was a, there was about three years in between that. Um, <laughs> but very briefly, wife again, I was married at this point, I had a one-year-old, and she's a different master, so she got posted off to Berlin, and I'm like, okay, what will I do with myself? She's like, well, you can mind, you can mind our daughter for the next year anyway, because I'm going to work. And I was like, okay. So I landed in Berlin, great city, absolutely love it. We were there since 2014, and um, I think, uh, moving to Berlin and moving to Texas, I, when I got there I became um, a mentor at Texas. Texas arrived in Berlin around then, uh, maybe 2015, 
and became a mentor at Techstars for three years and then uh, had been working five or six other little things on the side uh, up to that point and one was doing really well it was like I was like I'm not going near VCs again I'm not going near VCs again and one of them was doing, doing, doing like a million revenue in the first year we took all that money we put it into all these other ideas and we're like and they all died and then took all the money and we're like oh crap being, a v, being an investor is really hard um, and they became a mentor and that was a great way to tap into the Techstars network and the Berlin network because there's a hundred mentors for Techstars program so you get to meet all of the other mentors in this whole room I'd get to meet all of you guys and I'd also meet 10 amazing teams every few months would come in. So I really enjoyed mentoring. Uh, I benefited from mentoring on Endeavor through Jerry Canelli and all of them. And uh, it was a great, great way to help those teams and see the quality of the teams. Um, so when Texas rang about a year and a half ago, they, are, yeah, they rang and they said, look, we're looking at this program with SAP. SAP's got a new fund and it's going to be focused on machine learning and B2B SaaS. I'm like, okay, uh, well, okay, <laughs> let's do that. And you'll be investing in 10 companies a year. And, uh, and you can pick whichever ones you want from all over the world and partnership with SAP. And that was a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and how does that partnership work? Because I, I used to run the partnership team at, at Web Summit. And sometimes, you know, when you build a product and you find a sponsor for it, it, it really works if it's kind of like a good match. So explain a little bit about how you work with SAP on the Foundry piece. Well, yeah, just, just on, on just... Techstars, how Techstars works, Techstars is a worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. And uh, uh, we have uh, Carolyn, who is here, she was program manager in uh, Virgin Media, I think in London. Uh, we have like Gene Murphy runs Startup Boost here, which came out of Startup Next, which was Techstars, which became Startup Boost, and it's now part of Techstars, our partnership with Techstars, not part of. And we have Startup Weekends, which run here in Google and stuff. So Techstars has everything from idea, inspiration, all the way to IPO. We had our first company that actually IPO'd, which is SendGrid last year that came through an accelerator model. So Techstars is this worldwide network of 38 accelerators around the world, plus all of these other divisions. And SAP, so it's, it's really, really established in the early stage uh, ecosystem of investors, founders, startups. We've had over 1,250 startups we've invested in around the world. And we, as in Techstars, uh, I just turned up recently. Um, and uh, we're gonna invest in about 380, 400 companies this year as well. So it's like really, the velocity grew by about 38% last year. Uh, they're opening in Bangalore, Singapore, Adelaide, around the world, because entrepreneurs are everywhere, and Techstars comes to them where they are in their ecosystems. Uh, increasingly, though, as accelerators have expanded, because Techstars was one of the first in the world to set up an accelerator. It wasn't even called an accelerator when they set up in Boulder, Colorado. And um, increasingly, you have to specialize, I think, as you go into new markets. So SAP is a great partner in that. And, and then flipping to the SAP side, SAP is like, it's kind of quite under radar, but it's like Europe's biggest... Uh, tech company, as far as, uh, as I can understand, 130, 140 billion market cap, started in Germany, uh, world's biggest enterprise application company, and they serve 380,000 customers. So they have this network. They are the network of enterprise applications. So if you get, this, you get these two amazing networks coming together so, um, that are very much focused on helping entrepreneurs succeed and also help SAP's 280,000 customers succeed. So I think my role in kind of as an MD, you're often a facilitator, you're like an API, to use a technical term, between large corporate and small startup down here, we're trying to be that kind of like that dating layer or that intermediary layer, that kind of um, that, that network in between both that they can both leverage. So if you come on our program, you get all of the benefits of Techstars and you get all the benefits of SAP. Mm. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, and talk to us a little bit about, uh, so you must receive so many applications, right? Uh, so only today you were actually running office hours in Dublin. In Huckletree. In, in Huckletree, yay. Um, so talk to us about the difference between um, Irish startups and, and startups you'd see then on the continent or in, in Berlin. Well, you'll see a startup in, in Berlin with an Irish accent in there. Like, yeah, is that an Irish startup? Yeah. Or you'll see, you'll meet an accent here. You'll meet a startup here in Ireland with a Russian accent. You're like, is that a Russian startup or an Irish startup? Yeah. So I think, um, like, I, I know, when, like, if someone says, like, we're an Irish startup, we're doing this, blah, 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 kind of moving away. We're like, we're a startup that solves this problem, blah, blah, yeah, blah. We happen to be based in Ireland, and we happen to have gone to an Irish university, and we happen to have very funny accents. Um, <laughs> I'd be like, what? Um, so... Yeah, I don't, it's, it, the difference isn't really there. The difference is more in the ecosystems and rather than the actual individual startups. So I think Berlin is, pro London's probably the biggest ecosystem in Europe. And I think, you, did yeah. you live in London as well? Or I did, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and Techstars has three programs in, uh, two programs in, in London. But, to give, but Berlin, I would say, is probably the fast follower, the, f the one I believe has got the most upside. So I think 
in terms of ecosystems where you're going to have uh, some more, you're going to have angel investors, you're going to have founders, you're going to have customers, you're going to have all of that. I think it's more ecosystems is, is mm -hmm. where would I plug myself in as a, as a founder today in Europe. I think Berlin would be one of the top places. I think Dublin is one of the top places I, I genuinely believe, particularly in B2B SaaS and enterprise mm -hmm. SaaS. Like if you think of like, we're talking to some of our buddy from Workday, you know, people from Salesforce, LinkedIn, all get Google all around here who have vast experience selling into enterprises and running mm -hmm. and scaling sales organizations. And typically they join these companies at Series C mm -hmm. um, or Series B, so they're still early in expanding, like I think Dropbox, not Dropbox, uh, HubSpot's second office, I'd say Boston was in yeah. Dublin. So you have this wealth of talent here. So I think as an entrepreneur, once you get past the first 10 people, you talk about building out a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to convince them to leave Workday or HubSpot to come on board. Mm -hmm. But if they're there five, ten years, they got in there some stock early on, they got a nice cushion, they could afford to probably take a risk for two, three mm -hmm. years and come on board as a late co-founder or part of your management team mm -hmm. and help build that out. So I think Dublin is definitely... Uh, so I haven't answered your question, like, what do I see the difference in? It's not the difference between the startups, it's the difference between the ecosystems. Because yeah. the startups can move around the place so easily. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to understand what is a Bulgarian startup when the CEO is mm -hmm. Croatian, but it's registered in London but they have developers here, but they have a guy in London and they have an office in Berlin. So yeah. it's getting more fragmented, I yeah. would say. And that's, that's a fair point. Uh, so when I was prepping uh, for tonight, I uh, came across a, a video interview you gave, I think in 2014. So it was a year after your uh, talk at, at Startup Grind, when you were praising <coughs> Ireland and, and the Dublin ecosystem. And sorry, I always say Dublin ecosystem, Irish ecosystem. Um, and you said uh, you, you made a joke. Is this not Sarah Cork? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, you, you, made a, it you made like a joke <laughs> and you said in 2014, oh, we should really be in over in SF. Do you think things would have worked out differently for the company if you had moved to the States? Uh, so if I had moved, yeah. If the, I wouldn't have moved the company. I'd have moved the founder. I think Intercom is like... Did they have a fundraising announcement today? Um, like Intercom, there's four founders. I think one of the founders moved to the Valley in the first few weeks, I, I think, in a company. Um, and technically, it's a US company, but it's an Irish company. Um, so I think, yeah, you see it an awful lot. Uh, companies, less and less. It depends on what you're doing. I think that's the thing. If you're selling a B2C or a marketplace thing in a German market, uh, and your market's there, then it doesn't necessarily make sense there. We were selling, it turns out, a lot of our early customers were uh, Silicon Valley so customers so um, we should have been out there but I just come back from living in the States Ray had just come back from Australia um, we, we both had young kids there was a few other factors we didn't necessarily want to go back to the States but it definitely improves your chances of raising money at better terms value valuation and um, getting better customers so I remember we spent six months working on some clients here and like six months and we got 3k i remember like Jeez. one one 24 hours in la got 100k yeah. uh, and we didn't even go to la they, they rang us from la so like it's not just the market of the staff and the teams it's the market of the, that you're selling to so san francisco buyers will buy really fast they'll take a risk they'll work with a startup they were a startup two years ago so they'll buy from you so your first 50 customers will happen faster so you don't need to relocate but you, you kind of really do i think once you get some traction in your home market I think you, one of your founding team or someone very senior that you trust to accelerate, uh, it does make a lot of sense to be in San Fran. Uh, just if your customer base of early adopters in the tech B2B SaaS world are there. Mm -hmm. uh, like one of our teams in uh, Bulgaria is doing really well right now. Like Google is a customer of theirs um, in the States. Uh, if, uh, like, but they also put five or six other companies there mm -hmm. ringing them every day and they're like a nine hour time difference trying to sell into them. So even logistically, mm -hmm. they're, they're like, okay, one of us probably has to go to the States in the next few months. So, mm -hmm. but that's the perfect way to do it. They already have customers there. I think if you can sell online, create the tap into some demand, have a great solution, you can sell anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I met some founders earlier today that did customers all over the world and nobody knows an Irish company. When you mm -hmm. go to whatever.com, put in your credit card, you don't necessarily know where the company is, you, you don't look at it. So if you can get some early traction in the US, and you think that there's a lot more customers there and you can get another 50, 100 customers there in the next mm -hmm. six months, mm -hmm. then it's not so much go to Silicon Valley, it's go to where your market is, yeah. that you can grow the fastest, get the most customers mm -hmm. and uh, build momentum in your company and then help you get to that next level. Okay, uh, so you mentioned a few really interesting things there. Um, th I think the, the sales cycle winning 3K after six months is heartbreaking. Um, and. I'm sure you come across a lot of startup companies now where you know you kind of ask yourself the question will anyone actually ever pay for this product or service and I think arguably commercial model or lack thereof is you know a weakness that a lot of early stage companies um, have so 
what moment or can you think back to when you knew that someone was going to pay for you know the, the product that you had built when i say give me money um <laughs> Yeah, you have to ask for money early on. And I think at the start, your first few customers, you're very nervous because that's hearing no and rejection and blah, blah, blah. And you want to have this pipeline rather than kind of a dead, dead deals. Um, I think um, a significant, there was one significant big, a big kind of uh, one or two big accountancy firms, I think, early on that uh, when, when, when we closed those deals, we knew not only like they were financially significant, but more importantly, it blew away investors, really, because they're like, how the hell did you sell to this type of organization? Mm -hmm. And um, that was a real moment where we knew it was really, it was a really tough sale. And uh, we knew that they were really good sales and really good logos and well known. But not only that, they were, they were a global brand. So it gave us a lot of mm -hmm. trust and it gave us a lot of credibility. And they had massive upside as well if we could manage that account and get into other geographies and other countries in the back mm -hmm. of that. So I think... Uh, a lot of time you'll see people trying to get those early pilots, but if you can get a nice logo in there too, it, it mm -hmm. does help, yeah. especially at early stage, if mm -hmm. you can show that. Um, it shows that there's potentially a big market to the, to the mm -hmm. investors. And I guess that's the beauty of Techstars pairing with you know, corporate partners because you have that use case from the beginning. Yeah, like this program was brilliant. SAP opened up the Rolodex mm -hmm. and in came about 20 different customer visits and we had like chief digital officers, chief innovation officers from Fortune 500, Fortune 5000 companies and one came in, a, a really great company, we, we've written about it since, uh, Byersdorf, which I hadn't heard of, but mm -hmm. are really successful. They make the brands like Nivea, um, so skincare, and, and, and they were really great to work with. And so fast they came in, okay, we like these four, let's have them pitched to our teams, and then a few weeks later, signed demos. So, right. I mean, signed pilots, paid pilots with the customers, and massive insight, and some of those are you now converting into bigger deals in the mm -hmm. back of it. So that's where corporate innovation works really well. You have these teams who are these large corporates who want to work with innovation but don't necessarily have access to the startups mm -hmm. so it's kind of matching the two of them and, and mm -hmm. SAP has all of these and Texas has a lot of access to the startups so if you bring the two of them together we want to scale that next year because if you can get your first few pilots first few logos not only do you get you get those things to help you with investment but you actually get data if you're doing machine learning if mm -hmm. you're doing uh, anything in artificial intelligence getting access to data these days as a small startup is really really difficult so partnering with someone like SAP and Texers, like Texers might be well known to Byersdorf, but SAP totally is. So yeah. seeing the SAP logo behind you uh, is, is, is massive. And knowing that you've been backed by SAP is, has been mm -hmm. a great advantage. Mm -hmm. And something I think SAP has been very generous with. And they ran mm -hmm. webinars and really gave these companies mm -hmm. the credibility that a lot of startups lack mm -hmm. in the marketplace. Okay. So talk to us about the companies you've invested in outside of um, Techstars. So I know we've talked about wellness, yoga, food, different sectors you're interested in, um, what kind of industries really excite you? Um, I should know that answer. Um, <laughs> I think kind of uh, interest, it's more, like early stage is really interesting, when you say interest me, what interests me is interesting people. And I think uh, interesting people, I go, why you, why now, is often and like, if they give you this amazing answer, you're like, oh, okay, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> um, and then also as well, if it's the why now and why you, like, why are you solving this problem and why does it matter to you? Like, that shows that you're going to really stick with it as well because there's going to be a lot of mm -hmm. uh, hurdles. But yeah, areas that I, I would have interest in, I think, I think, you know, <laughs> Warren Buffett said 20 years ago and like, uh, he said, he said 10 years ago, in 20 years, all the farmers would be driving Ferraris. Like, you know, we're kind of, we're hitting this global population mm -hmm. is growing, wellness, uh, food waste is, is a massive issue. Mm -hmm. um, so how can we be smarter with resources around that? Um, developer tools as developer, anything that's selling to developer tools, totally different thing. Uh, how can I make developers more lazy? Uh, basically, uh, how can I be optimize my laziness? Uh, I'm always a fan of that. Because um, developers will spend 50 quid on a solution rather than do it, you know, and they'll patch loads of them together uh, mm -hmm. in, in a bigger corporate, not in their own. Um, wellness, uh, I've invested in amazing digital well, actually, I didn't even know what it was. He, he was a brilliant founder. <laughs> I, I met him through mentoring, and then he went on. Three months later, he ended up, his company was 700. I met him, he was like five people. Three months, six months later, he had 700 full-time people, 2,000 part-time people in 15 countries. Uh, so mentor people, because now he's my mentor. And uh, he go, and he sold that, and he got rolled up into an IPO and sold that. And then he's like, I'm going again. I was like, okay, please let me invest. He goes, but I haven't told you what it is. Like, that'll ruin it. Don't tell me. Um, so, so I was like, I'll be something crap. And it'll be something I don't care about. But I just really want to work with, with Constantine. And uh, his character is the funniest German I've ever met. And... Um, 
which is saying something. Um, but he's brilliant. And, and he, he pitched it and I was like, whoa, I love it. It's, it's digital, digital back pain therapy is one of the things he's doing. And um, he has this great app and I've used it a few times and it combines a bit of like um, Pilates yoga and then it has, yeah. but has the education and has the meditation part. But he's looking to, like all these people are on back pain or need to be educated. He, he kind of almost became a professional tennis player at 21, and this is the why and the why now. Mm -hmm. Then, well, I'd invest at this age. So this is breaking my rule, but it, his data backs <laughs> it up. But he was, only, but he had to go to a pain clinic, and he said he paid 80 grand for his insurance, and all he did is observe him and educate mm -hmm. him and give him some ex stretching exercise. You're, you're, here, you're feeling pain here, but it's been caused by down here and all this kind of stuff. So he has an app that does that, and it's brilliant. And he's replacing all of these millions of dollars in drugs people are taking for pain relief and stuff. So it's morally very cool. But I did invest in that before I knew what it was. But often, whatever you're investing in anyway, it doesn't matter because it's going to change at that stage. Like the analogy I use, you're investing in the jockey. Mm -hmm. The horse isn't even there. Like maybe it's a cow. I don't know what they're going to be on top of. But like, uh, like as someone said, I don't care what billion dollar company you make, just make a billion dollar company mm -hmm. as an investor. But um, so you're very, really much investing in the jockey because they will change and you'll be stuck with the jockey kind yeah. of thing. And, and, and I think mm -hmm. that's at early stage, I find that interesting. And I also, obviously, machine learning is, is fascinating as well. But I don't really care so much about the product demos or the tech. I care about the problem they're solving, why it's impactful, the market, mm -hmm. how they think about it, how they're going to go to market. That's way more interesting to talk to someone. Okay. So it sounds like you, you buy people rather than Well, products. buy people. Not uh, buy, sorry. Yeah, you yeah, buy yeah, into yeah, people, yeah. you buy into their I think that got ideas. banned recently, I'm not um, sure. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, like we're minority investors as an angel investor. Like you're investing with the founders at that stage. So if the founders mm -hmm. are getting screwed later on, you're yeah. getting screwed with them and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, yeah. And you only kind of need to go along to any of the kind of accelerator programs in, in Ireland, anywhere else. And the team slide arguably comes at the very, very end of the presentation. So, uh, you know, what advice would you give to, to someone? Because if you're saying that investors care about the people, why would they wait until the very end to go, oh, and by the way, this is who we are? It, like, <laughs> it depends. That's the famous consulting answer. Um, so if you have a 30 second presentation and one of your co-founders is the uh, former CIO of HBO, you mention that, in the f you make sure you mention that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you have five minutes, you probably put it in the team slide, you can put it in the team slide. It, it, de it depends. We're all, like, pres so Techstar is, we have three parts of our program. One is Mentor Madness. We meet 100 mentors in, t in, in 10, 10 days, which is just nuts and that's why it's called Mentor Madness. Mentor A will say that's brilliant. Mentor B will say that's stupid. Mentor C says you're a genius, and by the end of it, you don't know what's happening. But that job as a founder is to take all that. Then we have execution and growth, where you take all of that and try and grow on the back of it. And then the last four weeks are all about storytelling, storytelling for investors, preparing your pitch, your investor deck, everything like that. So it really depends on how strong your story is and where the strengths of your mm -hmm. story are. So if you're growing, if you have 60% negative, it's like you, you can have a data story or you can have a story. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have 60% negative user churn, you're growing at 25% a month, your MRR is now 60K, nobody's even looking at the slide. Mm -hmm. You haven't even gotten your team side and they're writing checks. Like they're throwing checks on stage. They don't care. So there's like, there's certain signals that they will go for, like mm -hmm. investors or anyone will go for. You're like, mm -hmm. I see that hockey stick in my head and it's going magically. But unfortunately, you don't always have that at the early stage. You have the potential of that. So then mm -hmm. you go, what's my next? I call it the gold in your story. What are the next nuggets you have to say out there? And if you have your team members went to MIT or they went to uh, ETH, this really great machine learning school or whatever, you get that out early to establish credibility because if what you're telling me all along, I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's true, I don't know if that's true, I don't know if that's true. But if you're like, actually, I spent seven years on my PhD in sustainable chemistry. Mm -hmm. We have a solution that takes 70% of the cost of your R&D. We, we saved one of the biggest shoe brands in the world they spent 100 grand um, and we did it in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It took them 10 months, millions of dollars, blah, 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 like, mm -hmm. which is one of our teams, Sustainalize, Invest Now. Um, th like, that gives credibility. So it's about telling your story, and every story is different, mm -hmm. I think, as well. You know? So it, it could be a visionary story, why, how the mm -hmm. world's going to change. Sometimes we have some very deeply technical ones to use an analogy and trying to give a story. So mm. uh, the answer is it depends. But like, we do always want to get your team out there. And, uh, they mightn't have gone to MIT, but they might have worked together for seven years. With one of our teams, mm. like they were 25, and the four of them had literally lived together for seven years and went to college. Blah, blah, blah. You know, like, so there's, mm -hmm. there's different dynamics for every team, and it's trying to find what that story arc for everyone is. Mm -hmm. And it's always different. Okay. So to what extent do you bring your founder experience into your daily job now? Ah, yeah, every day. Like we, at Texas, we, we say to our founders, like, we want to be your third founder. We want to be... Um, there with you and like every day I have a phone call with one or two of my founders uh, on a regular basis. I spoke to three of them yesterday. 
Um, I love evangelizing them. I love meeting investors. I love uh, meeting people who want to work with these amazing founders. And, and like, that was really important to me that we had a team that like, uh, I felt I could sell. And that mm -hmm. was kind of like, would I work for them? And I am working for them as an investor. Yeah. You are working for them. So um, I think you understand what investors will like an awful lot. And you also have strong empathy. You've been there. You've made all the, like I've made so many mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and you try and share that with them. And sometimes you recognize they're going to do it. And they do it. And then afterwards, you're there to say, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you mm -hmm. did do the mistake. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, let's discuss and how we can move forward. So um, it's great. It's more like being a grandparent and a, par a parent. You're kind of in the found, you know, you're the founder and you're in there every day. But mm -hmm. as a grandparent, you don't change the nappies as much. Uh, <laughs> and you can, you can go home and have a holiday at the weekend or whatever else. So mm -hmm. there is, a, you get, I'm not playing startup, but you get to spend really deep time with these companies. And, and uh, we only invest in 10 companies. HMD only invests in 10 companies per year. So you get, I get a year with just these 10 amazing companies and 13 weeks intense at the mm -hmm. start, but that's the start of it. And then afterwards, that's when it really, the Techstars network, we have 11,000 mentors in 38 different programs across the world. It's trying to navigate and connect them in and what, what funds, what investors. Like my number one goal, my number one objective in Techstars is build and strengthen the Techstars network. Mm -hmm. My number one advice to everyone is network, network, network. And you're all here, so you kind of get that to a certain extent. Um, and it's, it's so important, but it, it by like every morning 9 30 i'll meet investors i'll meet four investors probably a week 9 30 in the morning i'll have lunch with more investors and mentors and i'm just understanding what they want and trying to like send the right companies to them and just really working for them really hard and uh seeing them succeed and, and obviously i'm incentivized through that as well but uh again you're it's ego again ego is the enemy but ego used the right way is like they're my teams they're the teams i want to do well and uh but also the other texters teams if you get inbounds as well you love it's like this amazing discovery channel. You have like amazing founders every day. You're chatting to different ones and solving different problems and things you never even thought were problems. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly see billion dollar businesses you never even knew existed. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, so we'll open for Q&A in, in a couple of minutes. Um, I just have one more question. So if you think back five years ago, you were on stage talking about Ireland. Uh, you're here tonight talking about tech stars and, and your, your journey um, you know, up to this point. Imagine we're in kind of a similar situation in, in five years' time, um, 2023. What do you think you'll be talking about? Well, what, what I'd love to be talking about is, um, like, the phrase I use is, like, copy and steal everything. So, like, I think the Irish have done a great job in copying and stealing everything in terms of, like, the food in Dublin is fantastic. Like, living in Berlin, they don't like spicy food, blah, blah, blah. I got off the plane, went straight into DF, and, like, awesome Thai food, thank God. And that's the airport type. What food. time did you have that at again? Uh, lunchtime. Um, Before lunchtime. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh <laughs> man, something spicy. Um, so we've done a great job of that. But I think there's other things we can copy and steal. And I think, um, uh, I think it's Kingsley Aikens has that case to join, to copy and steal everything. And I think like things like rent is a big issue here right now. So like just go to Berlin, copy what they do on rent control. It's just brilliant. Like you don't have to worry about it. Everyone's obsessed now. And understandably so. I was living in Ranelagh and paying like 2011, got in, great rent, had a kid. We're living there, and it's like landlord comes along when the market changes, just as we were about to leave in 2014. He's like, yeah, rent's up 38%. I'm like, what? The? That couldn't happen in Berlin. Like, mm. there's, you can only go 5% a year. That means you have tenure. That means you know you're in that apartment. You're going to be there for the next few years. You can do it up. You can look after it, whatever. But it also means that 30, 40, 50K, mm -hmm. you could use that to start a cafe, start a taxi, start whatever entrepreneurship endeavor you want to do. Mm -hmm. And all this wealth isn't tied up in Irish property. Now, I've bought property of a landlord, but I just, it disgusts me and it kind of worries me that our obsession is on that. So that's more of a philosophical thing, but it's something, go to Berlin, copy what they have, and it creates this magical mm -hmm. environment where you don't have to worry about, once you're in the apartment, you don't have to worry about it again, mm -hmm. and you're there. So that's tenure for people who are renting. I think that's important for startup ecosystems. I think the other one is from the UK is maybe copy the angel investing. Uh, I think uh, Eamon Carey, one of the MDs in London, made a great point. Around here right now, there's probably, there's probably 100 people being paid over 250 grand probably in this building when you put in options, when you add in Facebook, when you add in the IFSC, there's probably a few thousand people in Dublin making more than 250 grand a year. And in the UK, if you make an angel investment, your first 150K, you basically get 90% tax relief. Second, you put in 150K, you get back 75K. And then if you lose the money in the other bit over the next few years, you can claim that off your tax for the next few years. So guess what? All these guys sitting around and girls mm -hmm. sitting around 
London getting paid massive salaries. They're like, they're all angel investors now, and they're all kickstarting that. So that's something easy. And I know Gene and other people in the startup Ireland have been like, just copy the exact text. It's in English. The German one you'd have to translate, mm -hmm. but the English one, you know, just copy so that. So in, in five years' time, are you going to have copied all this stuff? And yeah, let's, be just, be, let's, just, be the, let's be the copy and steal everything kings of the world. Like, let's say whoever's got a good idea. Like, we, we find some great restaurant in the back arse of Vietnam. I'm sure it'll be in Dublin in six months because some Irish entrepreneur will bring it back. Or It's great, but let's, let's do that at a government policy level. And there's a few things like that, I think, uh, we were great, like kindergartens, there's another one in Berlin. Like we, I was in Randall paying 1,100 quid, and like, I don't know if I could be afford to be a founder mm. like, without having some sort of exit, because I paid 200 euros in Berlin, and I'm getting paid way more than I was, and I'm still paying 200 euros, and it's like they're going to opera, and they're having organic food, and they're doing this, and they're, they have a sauna, and they have like, well, sauna day today, daddy, and I'm like, what? And she says it in German, so I don't know what she's saying. But, <laughs> but like, these little things we can get right at a policy level, mm -hmm. because you know, uh, Kings the Akins again, who's someone I admire massively, goes like, we're no longer this information age, we're in this networked age. And I think if Dublin can be the place you go to network and plug into startup ecosystems and networks, I think Dublin will do very well. So mm -hmm. I think like it is doing well, but it's at risk of overheating for all these other competing industries and everything like that, which is fair enough. And I, and I, and I think competition's great. But I think some of the fundamental policy things could be done to make Dublin, in my view, Dublin is one of the top three cities to live in from quality of life, from a startup mm -hmm. point of view, from a tech point of view in Europe right now. And I, I, I think uh, Berlin is probably number two and London's probably number one, but I think in five years, Berlin will be number one. God knows what's going to happen with Brexit in London, but I think Dublin will still be in the top three, and I think we, I hope we continue to build on top of that. Okay. Yeah. So do you think we'll see Connor Murphy, the founder, again? Yeah, probably. Texter will probably fire me after this video. So again, <laughs> it goes back to like, why did I start Datahug? Because suddenly I had a bit of time in my hands, and uh, I had to do it. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'd like to think so, but like, I think you're in this multi-career, blah, blah, blah. I think I can be a founder, and I, I do love investing, and I think uh, like investing through tech stars is absolutely fantastic, and as you get better at it, um, you know, maybe there's opportunities to set up other funds as well, but I do think, like if I was to start something again, it'd probably be Data Hug 2, we joked about earlier, like I literally have one idea, and that's it, and um, I send it to markets there, so maybe Hug Data, whatever you want. Um, so I probably would do something like that again, and I think if I did, that's helping unlock networks at the individual level rather than the company. So I'd say machine learning and blockchain, obviously, if it's pitching investors. Um, but uh, I would probably like to do that again because everyone, every VC says it's not about the money, it's about the network. Mm. But the way they network is so inefficient, and I want to solve that still in my core. And I believe Techstars is the network to help entrepreneurs succeed. And it recognizes that by making my number one objective build and strengthen the network. Mm -hmm. So like, I love working within Techstars. But um, yeah, the, I'm 38 now, and I think what I, uh, you always read the stats that you know line up with your age, and they're like, most successful entrepreneurs in the valley start companies at 38. I was like, woohoo! So I got, <laughs> I got another two, three months to uh, start that one. So any, yeah. Okay, cool. Would anyone like to ask a question? There you go. I was just wondering. It was not important overall in the end. Um, we referred to it a few times, so it kind of gives some investors who are not that savvy probably comfort. Um, and we did it in the US because uh, it was cheaper, easier, and faster. And to be honest, you can't really patent software in Europe anyway or properly globally. Yeah. I wouldn't do it again, probably. It was really boring, too. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions? Um, you can probably shout, actually. Yeah, I can repeat the question. I can repeat the question yeah. briefly if you want. Yeah. Uh, can you ever compare actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can hear you. <laughs> I suppose my main thing was uh, like I'm coming from the perspective from I guess like a big big product off the ground, essentially a marketplace. Imagine so like buyers and sellers, but for like um, peer to peer like debt sharing, and I mean. You hear a lot about things with VCs and how, like, you know, you just get hammered into the ground and, like, you know, firms are very difficult and you get to, like, drag it on, drag it on, on sort of, like, stifling shouting kind of language. And <coughs> my own question do you feel that if you really want to scale and have a global product, that's inevitable to get to VC financing? I mean, or is it like, is there enough in terms of network with, like, tech stars that various angel investors can tide you over and that you really can bootstrap? at least 
So the question is, B2C marketplace, can I scale a company without taking VC, basically? Yeah. Yeah? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, um, I'm not a B2C expert, but like, in the B2B space, there's an amazing Irish company called Teamwork.com, and uh, they're killing it. Like, they're doing, I don't know, last I heard, 10 million, so I'm guessing, 50, mm. I don't know how many millions they're doing. And they're down in Cork, set their own culture, they've kept it all together. They went a bit slower at the start, but they got there. I think the beauty would probably, but it depends on your company, it depends on what you need to incentivize. Like you see a lot of people with blockchains and ICOs, that's, that's probably scaring the crap out of VCs right now, which, which is great. Um, and Berlin is a really strong blockchain town. So blockchain with ICOs, if you have a marketplace, you want to incentivize one part of your network. And ICOs, in theory, how you do that, and, and one way you can actually create liquidity and create these network effects within your marketplace where you issue tokens and you're not diluting equity. So all these companies doing ICOs still have 100% control of their companies. Um, so that's very appealing. Now, whether that works out long term, that would be fascinating. But I think that's the, the last year has been the year of the ICO and what that means. People are sitting there with 30 million, 50 million, 60 million, and a team of five. They're like, okay, we said we're going to build all this crap. Um, <laughs> I've got 50 million in a yellow Lamborghini now. So I don't know what's going to happen with the yellow Lambo crowd. But um, yeah, that's, that's a new mechanism to do that. Um, so yeah, ICO. Let's see what happens. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Connor. Um, can you explain the role of the kitchen, I would imagine, okay? I'm really interested in uh, growing areas, okay? So be it AI or VR or not a dominant winner yet. And people are pitching you and they're saying, well, we're different from the rest of the AR, VR, AI crowd because such and such, right, whatever it is. But like, ultimately, the, the standard is not set yet, okay? We think. So how, how, what does differentiation mean? Because anyone can pivot into their space at any moment in time, you know, because everything is so fluid. I mean, it's hard for Twitter to change but it's very easy when there was no Twitter for uh, anyone else to, to, to pivot in that space. So I guess I'm interested because you were hearing a lot of pitches, which I guess sounded very similar to each other in some cases, but people are still trying to differentiate. And does that matter? Does it really just come down to team and those sorts of things? So how, how do we select what companies we invest in, basically, I suppose? How do we select which ones? Because you're trying to select what's going to be a winner or, or something like that. And, I'm very simple. It's the answer is team. Like, like it's a bit but the text is we have six criteria for investing in, in companies, and those six criteria are team, 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 market, traction, and idea. And idea is actually the least important one because like um, how you articulate the idea and how you explain the idea is interesting. Um, but actually, we're really like the first thing I look at is the team video, and I look at the team, and I like, and that goes back to the why because like why. Why this space? Why now? Why VR? And you're like, well, I've been in VR for seven years. I'm passionate with VR. I was, a, I was a surgeon, and I couldn't. My sister was in Korea, and I couldn't operate on her or something like that. But with VR, I could do it, and that's my life mission. You're like, whoa, okay. Um, you know, there's the problem. They're going to definitely hammer their head against the wall until that market works. It doesn't work, and they might not be the winner, but they're definitely going to be. Uh, they're going to do everything they can. They're going to have respect in the industry, and they're going to have. They're probably going to. If I introduce them to investors, they're probably going to take them seriously. So you got to. You get a sense like that, so it's it's really really team. Um, and then you know, the next thing we look at is that market. Do we believe some people love blockchain, some people hate blockchain? So if you pitch me on blockchain, so it's one thing to differentiate is like Techstars or any VC or any investor. You think, oh, I pitched Techstars and they didn't like my idea. No, that one person of 180 people at Techstars didn't like that mm -hmm. specific area because that wasn't their focus. It wasn't their. But the next person absolutely could love it. So it's kind of hard to understand. That. Again, it's team, but it's investor. It's founder investor fit as well. So if the investor really cares with that idea, they will back people in that idea, and you know they might actually be more bullish than even founders are. You can see some things. So it's again at this stage, it's very, very, very people based. So it's about that dynamic. Uh, yeah, do you want to pick who goes next or? I would say 98% of the teams we invest in are multi-founder companies. Um, again, it's just so much work. You're trying to do an accelerator program where it's 12 weeks of ridiculously intensive. Like, we have the 100 mentors, so like you, you're going to be your head's melted. So even you need two, three founders or a team to spread across that. 
Um, we do invest rarely in single founders, but it's very rare. And just teams, teams is what we like to invest mm. in more so. Hey, Connor. Oh, hola. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was coming Why to you next. <laughs> it's a hot, hot tub. So, um, quick question. How do you tell, now that you're going through all the speeches, uh, in a way you're kind of filtering out um, a lot of ideas that uh, for people who want to apply to the accelerator, how do you tell from a perceived market size uh, from an actual market size? So how much, how many times does it happen that you go through the stage where their market evaluation is just wishful thinking? Yeah, no, it's a market. I have no clue uh, on that. Like, but I love. I, it's more again. Like, I think this is gonna be a big market. And you, I remember there's one of our teams which solves OKRs, objectives and key results, which is this performance management framework, famous here in Google, uh, and made famous originally by Intel. But Google uses it as their performance management framework. So you set your objectives and your key results. And one of our companies is just doing really well in that. We're like, oh, that's a niche. That's gonna be a small market. Blah blah. blah. I'm like. I'm like, hell no, it's not. Like, performance management across peoples. And they're like, no, it's just a HR, the HR team. Selling to HR is impossible. Like, look at the data. The CEOs and the COOs are using it. And they're, these company, this company, like, while raising their money, like, while signing a term sheet, doubled their MRR. So I'm like, they're going to win. So, like, the ones that cause the most controversy internally in our investment mm -hmm. team, where, like, literally, two of my other investor colleagues are like, nah, nah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a niche. We love the team. We think it's great, but it'll probably just it'll grow to this size. I'm like, no, this is going to be amazing. So. Again, that's just like down in the pub having a pint and you're kind of like, oh, I think Italy's going to win the game. Like, no way, Ireland's going to win. It's, <laughs> it's literally down to that. And you might have some insight and the founder infected me, basically. The founder is just like, this is why. And I'm like, oh, man, OK. <laughs> then this and this and this. It's a decentralized world. People are going to be you know, moving between careers quicker. People are, he gave me all these reasons, which I probably couldn't articulate back to the other investors. So it's, it's, uh, it totally depends, and I think you, know, you, you, you probably got that with Logograph. They're like, oh, it's a niche, it's just on Twitter, but like, then you go into video and you go into more, and I think a lot of great companies start in a niche. Like, if you think about it, Facebook started in a niche. It was just like, oh, it was just a Harvard network. And then Apple, where did that start? Computer Club, 50 people. So like, getting the hardcore users who love it, mm -hmm. and then the question is, okay, that's one thing, but is that going to grow? And I, I don't know, did the Apple investors know that was going to grow? Did the Facebook guys know it was going to grow? The earliest investors, the guys that come in later, are just all getting in on, you know, getting their logos onto the, onto the company. But I, I don't have a clue is the short answer. But it's kind of like, yeah, there's a bit of, I just want to back these guys. Or like, I want to, it's a bit of, it's competitive maybe a little bit. Someone says no, I'm like, yeah, no, it definitely will. And then maybe you back yourself. Maybe I didn't even believe that. Maybe this is argumentative and I just suddenly convinced myself that it will be. But yeah. Okay. Probably time for two more questions. So... Uh, yeah, well, I didn't optimize for control. Um, <laughs> well, like, I'll answer it in two. Is like first, what I love about being a mentor at Techstars, and the analogy I use, and this not official Techstars visual at all, but it's like I always see. I describe like every year in let's say January fourth in Dublin, there's like 500 like mini turtles born on the on the beach in Dublin. It's like you know the, the beaches in Costa Rica. And they all come out and they've got to make 50 meters down to the water and there's like 600 seagulls over them and they're just like swooping in eating them. And about three turtles make it down to the beach. And I can almost see like oh. text, uh, I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, like, t the, like having a mentor network like Texas or something like that is just like this umbrella that'll get you at least halfway down the beach. Cause, <laughs> because, you know, if you think of it now, we're trying to move that shift of that power back to the early stage founders because you're a first time founder, you've never done it before, you don't have a clue what are good terms? How do I optimize for control? You can read the books, but until you're actually in front of a lawyer three years later and this term is suddenly popping up, you're like, oh, crap, is that what that means? Um, <laughs> if you have good mentors, and that's why we surround so many mentors, because you literally have, and also you have all these founders, like 12, 1,300 companies, and 5% of all Series A deals in the United States were Texas companies in 2015. So every VC is investing in a Texas company probably who is uh, of scale. So you can ring up those, you can see inside the Texas private network, I'm get, I got a term sheet from Johnny uh, or Mary, and you're like, yeah, oh man, Mary screwed us over, blah, blah, blah. This term, she got us on this. So it actually, the, the founders can help share that information as well about what control, what terms, or can you really trust that investor? They're just doing for financial, do they care about it? The, sh the short answer, the longer answer I gave, but the short answer is um, optimizing for terms. I would optimize for 
like my first investor, I knew 40 minutes and I took $1.5 million in two board seats. So I was like, woohoo, loads of money. <laughs> oh crap, they don't mind those two board seats. Well, 40 minutes. Like, I probably know half of you guys longer already, probably from <laughs> coffee outside there. It was literally that <laughs> fast um, and that stupid. But amazing, amazing founder. But like, there was no investor founder fit. So the longer you can spend with the investor and really talking about like your deep, dark secrets about it, your real vision for the company, and then seeing do they share that and are they actually before they actually invest are they making those introductions for you are they helping you are they spending time with you are they brainstorming with you and then you get a sense because it's, it's not just it, it's that fit and then um you know if those investors and you really like them i've seen this happen a lot and it's unfortunate where those investors help you for six months for a year you work really close with them and they offer to invest let's say one million a three million valuation and then these other investors came in because they just they saw the term sheet and they're like oh yeah the, the seagulls, they saw the seagulls flying and a few other seagulls arrived and they're like, um, yeah, we'll give you 1.5 million at a 4.5 million valuation. And you're like, whoa, and that's kind of what happened to me. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go for that one. Sorry, lads, good luck. And uh, it, was, it wasn't exactly like that, but I've seen it happen. And you suddenly in this relationship over here, it's like getting married on the first date. Whereas you've been dating someone over here for six months, you've, you've a better chance probably of, of uh, success. So they're kind of the differences as well on optimizing so loads of investors will turn up at the end like 80 percent will turn up at the end when you've 80 percent of your money raised kind of thing um so yeah okay one last question i know we'll all get out in a, in a minute <laughs> Sounds like a nice pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Stopping people take it in different directions. Yeah. Um, so how do I know data how to go to market and how do I stop? I'm not sure I understand the second step. You know, we have a very clear roadmap. Um, okay. But I also have ideas for it. So I think data balance is obviously the first step. Yeah. Um, so long term data here. I, I think there's a great blog post by the Intercom founders uh, called um, 666, I would read. And they, uh, they talk about you have a six year vision. I think it was a really good. Way, and you have a six month strategy. And you have a six six week kind of tactical window. So that's kind of your roadmap is kind of, you, you have your vision, your roadmap should line with the six year vision, should line with the six month strategy. But it, what you're actually doing in a detailed sense in the next six weeks, I think, is one way to do it. And then, because you always have to course correct, you have to be flexible depending on where the market is. Again, that's what we say, you have the team, but it's like, can that team find the path to what you want to do? And if you have the vision, you still have your North Star, so you can go left five degrees, right five degrees, and you can kind of keep coming back to it. But the order of your roadmap will always change as you engage customers. So GDPR suddenly becomes a priority. And then GDPR after May 25th, maybe something else becomes a priority. Integration with Salesforce. So it changes for every customer you have. But as long as they all align with your bigger vision, then it, it's potentially OK. I have heard of a founder who kind of went way off course at Datahug. Um, not Datahug um, and I, I have a lot of respect for this guy. He had raised, I think, 25 million. And he was after raising a few million. And uh, he fired all of his customers. He said, oh, we're giving you back all the money because we've gotten too far off course. It isn't going to work, and we want to come back over here. And I was like, whoa, I love you. Uh, how, how could I have done I could have met you four years ago, and maybe, maybe. But um, I could have done, gone that different direction. But yeah, so it's customers will, your first customers will dictate that to a certain extent. But without your first customers, you have nothing either. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg a little bit. But if you pitch your customers your vision and they're buying into that, then it's just how you get there. But if you're pitching them something else, um, then you could have problem, problems. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, great. I know there's a, a couple more questions, but we're all, um, hopefully everyone is able to stick around. We'll have some food and beers outside. Um, thank you so much, Connor. That was a really, really interesting discussion, very frank and honest. Can we all put our hands together for Connor? Thank you.